And welcome once again to Conversations with the Owl. This is episode nine. I'm here. I'm Mike McGrainer, your host, and my co-host, Vitas Bars Dukas, writer on Night Owl Theater. Hello, everybody. And the man of the hour and the days and the weeks and the year, 50th anniversary, Fritz the Night Owl himself. And greetings, good groovers. Uh, welcome to the Night Owl Jazz Entertainment Megaplex and Pleasure Dome, where we show the best in movies and conversation. So good to be here. Glad that you're listening, and thank you for everything all over the years. Do you think they believe that? <laughs> <laughs> let, let us hope. If they've got enough alcohol in them, yes. they believe anything. No, uh, but it's Friday, Our kind so of I hope people. you have pizza and alcohol. and uh, Anchovies on the pizza. There you go. Yeah, there Anchovies you go. on Fritz's pizza. No one else listening, I'm sure, if you guys care about your taste buds at all. Why can't, did you say you cannot taste anchovies or is it just from my oh no anchovies are very salty and with with a beer i mean you, your taste buds will throw a party for your mouth <laughs> he might actually be an owl good is what we're no but i mean out. among no no when i grew up as um, when my sicilian grandmother cooked i mean she always used anchovies on her on her pizza i mean we grew i grew up with uh, anchovies so I, I just remember heading to our shows and we would get pizza sometimes and take to the shows and Fritz got anchovies on his pizza <coughs> and we were taking the pizzas in the car and the rest of us had like I don't know pepperoni and cheese and regular stuff but his pizza like you could taste his anchovies on our pizza because like the smell bled into <laughs> the that's, that's amazing because dough. as I say the main taste of anchovies is salty and and that's what goes makes it go so good with beer Sure. Okay. Good, yeah. okay. Good yeah. So, so much for anchovies. But <laughs> try them. Try them. Try them on your pizza yeah. when you're drinking a dr drinking a line and cool goal and hay. There you go. Terrific. There you go. <laughs> we have Christian on audio and tech. Say hello. Oh, hey, hey, everybody. Look, he has a mic. <laughs> He's gonna get spoiled. But uh, so it's been a while. It's been a few weeks since we last met. Um, how's everybody doing? What did uh, Let's see, the Oscars happened, <coughs> and uh, things went pretty much how I thought they would. Oppenheimer stole everything, and nothing else got a chance. Uh, <laughs> like I hope you saw the nominees this year. Uh, I was pulling for Saltburn, and it didn't even get a nomination. So that was that was my pick. Oh, well. Uh, any any prediction or uh, did your predictions come true? I was only three wrong, by the way. Um, actually, I only saw one of the films. Okay, cool. Which film was it? <laughs> it was Barbie, which, oh, I, which I saw with my daughters. So Was that not better than it should have been? I mean, like, I thought for sure I was going to see a dumb comedy. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I was not looking forward to it at all. And then, um, so I saw it, and I, you know, it's these moments when you've got daughters that these types of movies have more impact for me, so in which I enjoyed it because I was watching them enjoy it. Like, there's the scene... Um, this might not be a, the best example, but in one of the Marvel movies, yeah, I think it's in... Um, Endgame, where all the women come together, you know, and it's the, the much maligned scene where all the women come together for this big battle. It, but my daughters really loved it. Like, you know, they they I could they got really excited for that one scene, and I'm like, yeah, I know I can look at it one way in a really cynical way and say it's kind of forced and all this, but in other aspects, you know, it was kind of cool just to see that. So I did enjoy Barbie, you know, for for many different reasons. <laughs> it's good. Um, Oppenheimer was great. It deserved everything it got. My problem is. Christopher Nolan doesn't give anyone else a chance. It's not his fault, but it's like if he's made a movie. Sure. Goodbye, yeah. everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every other nomination. Sure. But, um, and then Billie Eilish, of course, won for the Barbie song, <coughs> which uh, brought me to tears that night. I sure. Was, I was watching the Academy Awards, not expecting to cry at all to Billie Eilish. Right. For God's sakes. But uh, that was she 22? Ripped it, ripped it right out of everybody. And I think she's got more Oscars than Martin Scorsese. She does. There was a joke. There was a joke that Rob from State Theater said, where he said, "I hope she's at the after party, walking up to DiCaprio, asking where his <laughs> second Oscar is." Sure. So you know, Robert Downey Jr. Of course, <coughs> first Oscar ever. Right. Which uh, on his third career. Yes. So that is uh, pretty amazing. But uh, but enough about that. But we are going to celebrate. Movie season by talking about movies, our favorite movies and favorite movie moments. I know that uh, we were discussing Dune two. I have not seen it yet. I will be seeing it soon. Um, Christopher Walken is in Dune two, 
And from what I understand, Christopher Walken is not Christopher Walken in this movie. And that's honestly the most excited... For me, it's the most exciting thing to look forward to, to see this. So, <clears throat> But mentioning Christopher Walken, I want to throw it to Fritz because there's a scene in a movie called Pennies from Heaven, and he's going to tell you all about it. Well, it's sort of a thing that... Uh... It was Steve Martin and, um, oh, I for, forget his wife's name at the time, uh, Bernadette Peters. Fantastic movie, kind of a, a, a throwback to the 1940s MGM and 20th Century Fox big musicals. Martin does a terrific job. There's some terrific song and dance numbers in there. But in the course of the movie, towards the end, the character Christopher Walken is introduced, and he's kind of a disreputable guy who gets involved in uh, selling women and so forth, and and he's trying to get um, Bernadette Peters to become one of his girls. And in the course of that, he starts to sing and dance, and I had never seen Christopher Walken, who was always one of my favorite actors, didn't have the vaguest idea he could dance like that. I mean, it's a thing. He, he think he is just true, and he does a strip while he's dancing. So, you talk about movie. You talk about moments in movies that just stop you. Yeah, sure. For me, that was that was the best thing in the movie, and uh, uh, I'll watch it whenever I can just to see that sequence of Christopher Walken doing the tap dance on the bar. And I mean, we're not talking about 30 seconds. We're talking about three, four minutes and some really intricate a stare Kelly kind of things. And so was, wasn't his background originally he was a dancer? And then well, that's what I heard yeah. afterwards yeah. was was that he originally started off as, as, as a dancer. As a dancer, right. But but that that part of the movie is worth seeing the whole film for. Yeah. And But it's a good, I, it's a good movie, although apparently it did bomb at the box office. I don't know why, but... Well, I mean, uh, there's a lot of good movies that bombed that became... I think what were you saying? New York, New York. Was yeah, not a hit, but you liked it. <laughs> well, New York, New York, never became a hit even after they did the revised version where they put in the footage that had been cut out of the uh, other one. When I saw New York, New York the second time, it was at a Megaplex theater up in. Uh, I think it was either one sixty one or, or or more. So I forget where it was, but there were three <coughs> there were three three theaters in that one building, and New York, New York was was showing in one. And it turned out that I was the only person in the audience that night when they showed it. And I had met the manager before in the lobby, and I told him I said, "Look, if I'm going to be the only one there, you know, you don't have to do right. send the projectionist." projectionist home and that's when i learned that movies no longer like in my days at the clinton clinton theater they no longer had a projectionist yeah and so the guy said well we're going to show the movie whether there's anybody in there or not so i went in and i was the only one in the theater and i felt like citizen kane (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's uh yeah i christopher walken i think the first time i saw him dance (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me. It was a music video from Fat Boy Slim called "Weapon of Choice." You know, and uh, you know, my my cousin in law shot that. He was the cinematographer oh. for that. So he did REM's um, tour film. He did um, that video. He also did um, Being John Malkovich. And I was talking to him, and I said, hey, "Have you ever been intimidated by anybody? You know, any of the actors that you've worked with? You know, like with John Malkovich or you know John Cusack or anything?" And he said, "The only person that kind of." Weirded him, out, weirded him out was Christopher Walken. He just said he's just a off guy. Yeah, but Dennis, right, I mean, Dennis Hopper in his latest years, later years, was that kind of character. I mean, I would go to see, if Christopher Walken or Dennis Hopper is in a movie, I'll go see it. Yeah. It's like um, uh, Siskel and Ebert. There was one of them that said he had a rule. I forget the guy's yeah, actor's it was, it was, name. And, and what, you know what's he funny? He said that if this that. guy was in a movie, it was automatically and, a good and movie and Dean see Stan. it. Harry Dean Stanton. And, and uh, yeah. Walsh? M- Emmett Walsh? M- 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 Walsh? Emmett Walsh, yeah. yeah. No, M- Emmett Walsh was who he was talking about. Yeah. And he was, <laughs> and he was quite right. 
except for, do you remember which movie? Because we talk about this in Blade Runner. Yeah, it, literally. So we just had the Blade Runners. Uh, uh, we had Robocop, Wayne's World, and Blade Runner, which we'll talk about in a bit. But at the Blade Runner screening, one of your segments literally is this, where you talk about the M.M. at Walsh thing. Mm -hmm. The rule, and uh, but it was broken by, because he was also in Wild Wild West. Yeah. yeah. Was, yeah. So, so he broke that rule in that movie. So, you know, maybe uh, he needed a payment on his Lamborghini. Yeah, he need another pool or something, yeah. Yeah. He sadly uh, passed on, uh, but he is in Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, also as the uh, pharmacist. Huh. Now, my geezer, my geezer memory is failing me here, but there was a guy that uh, Paul Newman used to use in a lot of his movies, and that was like in Cool Hand Luke, the guy that played the warden who said, what we have here is failure to communicate. <laughs> right. Forget the guy's name, but if he yeah, was in like a, a like a like a kind of a goofy name, right? Yeah, like Slim Pickens, like that kind yeah. of name, right? But if he if was only, in, if only if had only the internet, device, if he then. was in a movie, it automatically got an extra star just because he was. We'll in call it. him Wally Pancake <laughs> until we have the answer. Because <laughs> why not? Just made that up, Fritz. <laughs> if you ever want to draw a comic, we're going to call a character Wally Pancake. Hmm. Uh, no, I'm. Who is Wally Pancake? <laughs> just some shit I spilled off the top of my mouth just now. Oh, okay. So, so it's, it's not. not it's not a Clifton reference James. Not we would James. know. Um, do you remember what is John McLean? Mc no, no, no. It's a goofy name. Just like he something. would be about the third or fourth billing. Yeah, I just see Paul Newman, George Kennedy, Struther Martin. Struther Martin. Is that who it is? Okay. That's who it is. Yeah. Hey, that's who it is. Yeah, oh, that's not a goofy name. I don't know what I was thinking of. My bad. Yeah. But again, Paul Newman. Paul Newman used him in a lot of his movies, and he all no matter what he character he was playing, he always lifted the movie up yeah. one notch <coughs> just sure. because he was so good. But I I liked uh, a lot of the supporting characters in my days as an usher at the Clinton Theater, where I would see, oh, I would see the same movie maybe six or seven times uh, I really got to know and enjoy a lot of the characters whose names were below the title like one of my favorite uh, characters as a villain is Steve Cochran who had kind of an interesting life off screen but uh, on screen he was a terrific bad guy who were some of his what were some of his roles well one of his best was uh, as a Klansman in a movie called Storm Warning with uh, Doris Day, Ronald Reagan, and I believe Lauren Bacall. And it's called Storm Warning. And the, Steve, and, and, and in White Heat, he is, uh, he is in Cagney's gang, but he's trying to take it over when Cagney is sent to prison. And then on the other hand, he could handle comedy well because he was in the villain in a, some Danny Kay okay. movie. And he had an interesting life off screen. And um, again, he was one of those people that normally his name was the first one under the title. <clears throat> there were a couple of movies where his name was above the title. I think Storm Warning, he came before. I think he came, his name was after Doris Day who did not sing a note right. in this movie and really pulled it off as a dramatic actress. Hmm. <coughs> well, and you know, Reagan was good. Reagan was terrific also. Yeah, That blew my mind as a kid to when Reagan was president. I was real little, and when someone told me that he was an actor, I was like, no, he wasn't. Like, in my kid brain, it was like, People who have jobs can only do that job. Sure, right. <laughs> no sure. multi, multi. So I've never seen Ronald Reagan in a role, but uh, what was it like? What him and Schwarzenegger and Jesse Ventura is that his name? Or are those the only three people that were like actors and then turned politicians or what? I mean, it's really uh, Sonny Bono. If you want to call. Us. Oh, that's right. Yeah, uh, Sonny Bono. Bono. Yeah, yeah. Sonny Bono that I knew from Troll. Well, wasn't the I didn't guy? Know, I knew Troll I knew from I knew the Sonny Variety and Hours. And all. I think yeah. one of the guys that was on Love Boat was also became oh, a, really? became a politician. And the guy that was um, he was in Law and Order, and he was um, the boss of uh, the DA. That that was. Oh God! Who was the guy that I think he ran for president? But he was in Cape Fear, the Scorsese version. 
yeah. and George somebody, but like that dude, real recognizable actor. And I saw him like speaking as a politician one day, and I was like, "Oh well, that looks a, like that well, guy." Okay, well, there's Al, Al Franken, but maybe the well, guy, Al Franken, but also oh. the guy that you're thinking of. He, um, is that the guy who's in Hunt for October? He I think plays so. like one of the admirals or, or one of the captains. Face. Yeah, well, yeah, I, you know. I think that he was a, a state. He was a representative. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, uh, before he became an actor, right? Okay, yeah. so and he was he was a <laughs> he was a regular for maybe a year, I would say, uh, as Sam <laughs> as Sam Watterson's boss okay. on Law and Order, okay. which is one of my. One of my all-time favorite shows. I mean, it's I I'm a law and, I'm a Law and Order junkie. Yeah. I particularly like the version with 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 Jerry Orbach and Chris Noth were my two favorite versions of Law and Order. Yeah. Chris Noth but is I so good. But I only of them. know him from Sex in the City. I know oh, okay. Mr. Big, and I never saw Law and Order. And then when I saw reruns of Law and Order, I was just like, yeah. Hey. I mean, I'm there, I feel like Law and Order. Every if you're an actor in Hollywood, you've been. On an episode of Law and Order, I feel yeah. like that's just well, it was like five thousand episodes. Julia Roberts was uh, before she was a star; she was just a featured player, yeah, and was a character on Law and Order. I forget what what kind of character she played, but she was not a star yeah. at that time. And yeah. I have a great uncle that looks just like Jerry Orbach, and every time we had a family reunion, I swore it was him. And I'm just like, that's a guy from Dirty Dancing. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. It's just, it was not. But yeah, uh, uh, Sam Watterson's great, though. I mean, my God, what a power cast. But no, we're talking about like, so these actors like Christopher Walken, I know we mentioned Dennis Hopper. The most interesting actors that really pull you in are the people that are just a bit off. So, I mean, Dennis Hopper, Christopher Walken, Willem Dafoe. You know, sure. these are people where it's like, if you met them in a dark alley and you didn't know who they were, you'd run the other way. Maybe Clint Howard, too. But the thing is, is that, uh, but when you watch them, it's just, you, you can't take your eyes. It's They have such a unique look. I think the Dead yeah. Zone was the first movie I saw with Christopher Walken. And uh, the older I get, the better that movie gets. Because it bored me as a kid. It was kind of a political thriller or whatever. But, boy, I watched it recently. And, I mean, there's several jump scares in that. Um, it was great. But to think of it, he said in Pennies from Heaven, Christopher Walken was stripping and dancing. I don't want to see him or Willem Dafoe. Ever, I think you know, I've had nightmares about that actually. So. Well, you know, in the seventies, have you seen Charlie Varick? Charlie Bark. Varick. It's Bark? with uh, Wal- Walter Matthau and the. Well, yeah, I showed that on Night Owl. I remember the title, but I don't remember anything about it's, the so, movie. So, like Walter Matthau is like in a sex scene, you know, and oh, yeah, but it's one of those movies like it's, it's like Durwich. It's like what's from the seventies, and so these guys weren't all buff or whatever. It was just right. he was just a normal guy, and but it wasn't like a sex sex scene it was you know highly suggestive where they cut to the candle and it's like going down you know type of yeah, thing yeah. but you're like yeah i guess this is the 70s where <laughs> people like walter Matthau, you're gonna watch him in a sex scene you know but did he whistle when he said his ass he did not no he did not shake it off <laughs> he did not do that well, walter Matthau was a supporting player in uh Charade was Charade. Right? Oh yeah, along with James Coburn, whose name was below the title, yeah. and Charade was not a big the star at the time. Any movie, I mean, Cary Grant. I I have I have learned <coughs> when we started Night Owl in 2010, the new version. Uh, I hadn't seen that much Cary Grant, and just by you and I talking about him, started watching more Cary Grant. And I've I'm pretty convinced he's probably my favorite actor of all time. Cary Grant, yeah, oh, my God, sure. Like he's just he's he's the George Clooney of his time. But he made better movies. Like George Clooney's kind of had hits and misses, but he he is the new Cary Grant. But I mean, my God, I saw North by Northwest for the first time last year. Okay, uh, it took me that long, but I got a film print of it, and we were watching it. And um, he just has a way of like that camera's just not there. I mean, I mean, my God, it's like well, the thing is though, a little but, bit. But maybe, do, you, do you feel like though that he's playing different characters, or is he Cary, always no? He's with Cary Grant. Cary, <laughs> Cary Grant. With, no, with with Cary Grant, he was like Dean Martin. There was always, no matter what kind of character he was playing, there was just a touch of Dean Martin or uh, Cary yeah, Grant right, right. in that character. I never feel like he lost himself in the character. I always felt like he right. just changed his name. He's always going to look good. He's always going to be, yeah. Yeah. you know, Cary Grant. Knew his, knew his lines and could hit the mark yeah, on the first yeah. take. But, but well, if you ask me his character's name, I have no clue. It's Cary Grant. You know? well, one of them is, uh, there's a scene in Charade where she says something about, do you know who this is? And 
he he responds, and I'm not going to do it justice, but he he just responds with, "I don't know. How would I know?" It's just this such a like, why are you bugging? Like, this is bullshit. Why are you bugging me? Yeah, he yeah, has yeah, this yeah. great like way of dismissing you that sure. like like he's just a man going about his day and shit keeps happening. Sure, sure. And I think that's like I don't know. I just really, uh, but getting to see. <laughs> There's a lot of classics I haven't seen, and North by Northwest was on my list. But the the airplane sequence, which is in every trailer yeah. you see, but watching that scene in context, man, I was just like sitting there in my seat, rocking back and forth. Like, you just, that, that is a crazy suspense. Well, when, when it starts, because he gets off the bus and he's, and he's walking around, and then you see it in the background. Yeah. You know, you see the plane flying in the background, yeah. and then it's the way that they shot that scene, because then you mm-hmm. see it start turning in the background towards him, and you know, it's. I just think it's such a subtle, a slow build to way, the way that that scene, it's a slow build to that climax of that scene. Well, and it doesn't feel green screen like a oh, lot of that right. stuff was. Um, that scene in particular, I think they, I think they really were doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I, 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 yeah, maybe I'm pretty sure that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, Hitchcock has so many tricks, but yeah. But man, what a what a killer scene. Yeah. Another actor, kind of in the Grant uh, mold, was again a guy that uh, sometimes his name was above the title, sometimes below. Was George Sanders. Now, George Sanders had the greatest voice in the world. I always tried to do impressions of George Sanders, never could make it. But he won a supporting Oscar for his role in All About Eve, which if you're a theater major yeah. studying theater, that is the theater movie to watch, and Sanders is fantastic. Yeah. You showed me a scene As a bad steps. guy, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Is is Marilyn Monroe? Maybe? It's Mar- yeah. Marilyn Monroe's got a walk on in that, and a couple of lines here, here and there. But long before she was a star, and uh, she's um, oh, she's the girlfriend of some big Broadway producer, and all right, and so forth. Okay, but uh, again, a name to remember and see. All about Eve is the movie, and the actor is George Sanders. And, of course, Betty Davis and Ann Baxter are in the <coughs> all-star cast. As a matter of fact, Davis and Davis and Ann Baxter were both nominated as Best Actress, I think, mm-hmm. for that movie. Okay. Nice. Which is rare that, that two people from, two leads, two leads from the same movie will be nominated well, for. I mean, nowadays, best. it's like... There's seven movies and everyone's competing. There's like three people in the same category that sure. are all from the same movie. Sure. And it's it's kind of wild. But uh, uh, another movie I know that you've you had it playing here. You've already seen it a million times, Vitus. But uh, all that jazz. Oh yeah, is uh, I think one of you my two favorites. Agreed on Mm-hmm. It's one of one my of favorites. The best movies ever made. Well, it's one of my favorite movies. Yeah. <laughs> Again, there there is one scene in all that jazz that just stops me, and I, I'll watch it every time. And that's when he's dancing with his ex-wife and she's kind of teasing him about all the women he's had. Right. And she says, you don't even remember their names. And I won't go any farther than that other than to say his answer to that absolutely set me on the floor laughing. I'm pretty sure that film's been out enough years where we can do spoilers, maybe? (laughs) No, no, no. (laughs) And the music, the music, of course, is terrific. Bob and uh, Roy, Roy, yeah. Roy Scheider is is fabulous in it. And the guy that's playing kind of the Lenny Bruce character, I forget, I forget his name. Uh, well, All Edge Jazz is, is a terrific movie on a lot of levels. Yeah. Now, so is it? Is it? It's actually about Bob Fosse, right? Well, I think it's loosely it based on loosely like, based. Did Fosse loosely... direct it? Yeah, he. So I he, think well, he directed. It. Yeah, so I think he had would some... that have been for Roy Scheider to just be directed by the guy he's basically playing? Yeah, so it's loosely based on his life. I mean, but if you ask him, there's like lots of differences, you know. But if you read the biography of Bob Fosse, which I did after yeah. seeing the movie, you're like, okay, there's a lot of similarities. But you know, Bob Fosse had failing health, um, and I don't know if this was his way to talk about his impending death because at the end of the movie well you know don't oh, spoil it spoiler. Yeah, spoiler but um you know i think it works on if if you know bob fossey you know when he directed it it's really about him and then his relationship with death and and life and his approach to things and the women that he had and his life on broadway and i think some of the um 
the song that I think that he did, we you know with the um, airline that they're working on oh, in yeah. the film. I think that is based on something that he actually did. Not it was an airline, but it was something else. I think that he was working on. So, um, oh, speaking speaking of that, the numbers in that in the opening sequence, uh, uh, Bob Fosse character. The Roy Scheider yeah. character is auditioning dancers yeah, they had a for an hall. upcoming show, yeah, and I hall. mean to say that musical number and the dancing is equals anything yeah. MGM did at their right. at their peak. And you know, in the 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 end sequence, if we're talking talking about moments in film, yeah. the end sequence with his big dance number, you know, as he's dying and all the people are in the crowd that, you know, that we've seen throughout the film, like all of the people, like his ex-wife is there, his daughter's there watching him in this big dance number. Um, that, uh, I, the first time I saw the movie was in eighth grade. And I remember, I don't even know why I saw it, but I got it from, you know, the video store and I watched it. But that last scene has still, still affects me. Uh, the music is great. The dancing is great. Um, it's Roy Scheider singing, and he's fine. But Ben or Ben Vereen, um, yeah. you know, he's in that singing, and um, it's very seventies with some of the music and some of the you know choo choo like sound effects. But mm -hmm. it's still, I could watch that scene over and over and over again. But it's a very powerful scene because he's dying. I so need to see that as well. You really got to see that movie. Yeah, <coughs> there are many movies that. Uh... We gotta get Christian. We have to ask Christian about his opinions about some of these. Yes. Uh, well, that was gonna be my next thing. Is I want to move to some of our favorite movies around the room. But real quick, uh, some of the movies I haven't seen just offhand: Chinatown. Yeah, sure. I've never seen French Connection. I've oh never my seen. Goodness. Yeah, oh no, <laughs> dude. It, it's like there's sometimes I, when I was a kid, I used to cut posters out of the newspaper, like for movies that were showing around. And I know the posters of all these. Yeah. Iconic. So right. In my mind, I've seen the movie. I've made it up. Yeah. I'm afraid to watch some of these going like, what if they're not as good as like, well, I, think, I imagine they Well, were. I think some of them, you, you have to look at them, some of them as products of their time. Yeah. Um, right. You know, oh, we, well, All About Eve is one of those movies that uh, was more appropriate in the late 40s, early 50s, Yeah, because that's what Broadway was like in those days. I don't think it's that way anymore. But in those days, a Broadway star was up in the Beyonce right. uh, realm of stardom. But even with like all that jazz with Bob Fosse, I mean, he was a womanizer. He had um, you know a certain reputation. Right. And so you have to look at it through a lens, though, of if you look at it now, you might just condemn him and... Um, you know, he might not have any redeeming qualities to some people, but so if you look at it through a different lens, well, you know, you it's, know. So, it's so difficult because uh, as the world changes, and I know that this is, if, if it's controversial, not my bad, but uh, I know like relationships nowadays are, are different. Dating is different, and and some most relationships of people I know are open. And when I watch older movies that deal with that, you know, as a kid, I would have been like, oh my god, he's cheating on his wife. Yeah, sure. And then nowadays, I'm like, oh, the wife knows about it and everything. I mean, it's just a, the way the world has kind of moved. Well, well, it, oh, yeah. Well, even when we're watching Blade Runner, yeah. when um, he pushes, when Deckard pushes uh, the woman against you know against the, the wall. Well, and it's like at the time when I watched it, it's like, oh, he's being a tough guy. He's like right. you know, trying to get emotion from her because she's a replicant and blah, blah, blah. But my daughters are like, uh, what kind of movie is this? Yeah, dude. You so know? the other night, uh, which, which I guess we'll bring this up now. Um, thank you to everyone that has come out to three screenings so far for the 50th. They've all been packed. They've all been great. I hope you've all had a good time. I do want to talk about these movies a little bit. Uh, Blade Runner was the most recent one. Next week, next Thursday, will be Psycho. But right now we've done Robocop, Wayne's World, and Blade Runner. So we'll start with Blade Runner. Um, that scene, watching it now in this environment, I mean, it, it is... I was just like, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, sure. Raping this woman. Like, right, yeah, but, is, but like, you have to look... It feels very... Yeah, nowadays, but, but then yeah. You, she's a replicant, so... Well, it, 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 yeah, she, like, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, feelings? I guess, it, I, well, it, well, I guess if it's wrong today, it was wrong back then. But um, but is she a sex robot? But, you know, no, no. But it's like, but you're looking at it through a different lens. <laughs> right, That's yeah. all. Well, one of my all-time favorite movies is A Place in the Sun. Mm -hmm. Montgomery Clift, Liz Taylor, and Shelley Winters, who is magnificent in it. Well, this movie is so terrific. I wanted my granddaughters to see it, so I I made them come over. It was showing on TV. And we were watching it, and they couldn't understand the problem that Shelley Winters and Montgomery Clift had because she was having a baby out of wedlock. Yeah. 
and yet when this movie was made, that was a mortal Scandal. sin yeah. plus. Yeah. And um, as as I say, but they watched it in oh maybe the maybe the nineties. But I mean, to them, the whole thing was okay. So what's the big deal yeah. with the problem with Shelley Winters and Liz Taylor and Montgomery Clift? Sort of a love triangle there. Right. But George Stevens shot it, and with a scene where Taylor and Clift fall in love, if you took a date to that movie and you didn't come out falling in love with your date, yeah. there was something wrong. He yeah. was, well, Clift and Taylor and Winters were just so fabulous in that movie. And uh, again, it's one black and white, but I recommend it, even though it's slightly dated in its morality. Clift and Taylor and Shelley Winters, who actually started off, people think of her as the big heavyweight girl in Poseidon Invention, but they don't realize that in her early days, she was a pinup girl, yeah. very much like a tough blonde Marilyn Monroe. But I mean, she had a killer body, a lot of swim, a lot of uh, pinup pictures taken of Shelley Winters, and then uh, the, the, of course there's the I don't know whether it's a true story or not, but they tell it about her. She wanted to be in a movie, and the producer, casting director, was sort of, eh, wasn't real sure about her. And according to the story, she walks into his office with a bag, puts five Emmy, five Oscars on her desk, on his desk, and says, do you still want me to audition? Yeah, sure. And she yeah, got, yeah, yeah. if it's not a true story, it's a great story. <laughs> yeah. Fritz, I heard a story about you, and I want to know if it's true. All right. <laughs> Did you ever walk into an office to get a job and put your Emmy on the desk? No. Okay. Then it must have been that story, but I, I had heard, I thought it was like maybe something after Night Owl ended, because I remember you won an Emmy for the work that got you fired, as you said. Yeah. Like, you know. That was uh, my fifth. Yeah. So when you were looking for a job after that, I won't, like part of me is like, <laughs> why not just take that? No, it, 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 it. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> it it was it was on the resume that I had won five oh, okay, Emmy cool. for my performances, but it was I never carried it with me. A because <laughs> they're very very fragile, and I just didn't want to take the chance of right. it being broken in the car or carrying it around. Someone right. told me I should wear my Emmy around my neck when I'm looking for a job. I said, listen. That thing is heavy. <laughs> I mean, that's right. <laughs> and it, what's amazing about the Emmy, the one thing is like the wings on that whatever that, mm -hmm. that angel or whatever if anyone ever broke into the house i don't need to own a gun yeah that emmy that <laughs> literally is spaced right where your eyeballs will be i mean that's the creepiest thing in the world so yeah well sadly one of my emmys has that wing broken off and, and oh. it's even crazy glue wouldn't put it back on the emmys will actually uh fix that for you yeah Lifetime. but it's, it's the, the price on it's kind of pricey to have it done so uh -oh. I just face it in such a way that you can't tell that uh, the thing is broken off. Yeah. But no, no it, it, it's 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 sort of a thing that because they were so fragile, and that would have been out of character for me. I just yeah, couldn't. Yeah. I just couldn't. But <laughs> Shelley Shelley Winters, who was always, even her younger days, was always a brash, very forward, very aggressive, very ahead of her time mentally and so forth. Uh, that story is not untypical yeah. of what she would, whether it's true or not. Right. It right, still right. fits in her. I love stories like that character. Yeah. Like you know, I have a Christopher Walken story. I'm not sure I. Part of me, part of me wants to share it, and then if it's not true, it's like, well, sorry. But since I heard it from someone, I probably could share it. Uh, in in Hollywood, a lot of times, one of the unspoken things, but I guess it's spoken now. Sorry to anyone who throws these kind of parties, but every now and then you'll hear of a party happening at someone's house, whether it's you know somebody big, Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise, Christopher Walken, whatever. Well, this particular party was at Christopher Walken's house. And to get into these parties, you have to do – for them to have the security of it. Think Eyes Wide Shut and you got to have a password. You know, Fidelio is right. the password the movie. Well, this was uh, – <clears throat> you have to bring a beater car to the place. It can't be your nice car. It's got to be – got to pull up in just a clunker 
and they'll know that you got the mem like in, that you're supposed to be there. And so people are, you know, told to do two things to go to the Christopher Walken's party. Bring a clunker car and bring a can of tomato bisque soup. And you got in. And it was random enough to where it's like, well, of course that's correct. Because, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like, yeah. so everybody, you know, I'm sure is flooding Ralph's at the time. And, you know, all their tomato all their tomato bisque is gone. And no one knew why. And so they all, you know, get to the party. And the person I heard it from, which at this point, I mean, I spent well, more than 10 years on the road with bands and everything. So who knows where I heard it from. But I heard it. And a uh, person shows up to the party in his beater car, get tomato bisque. Goes into the party, can't find Christopher Walken anywhere. Like, doesn't even see him. It's his house, he's hosting it, whatever. And they see models and, you know, good-looking women around, stuff like that, and everybody, a bunch of movie stars are hobnobbing. (laughs) It turns out Christopher Walken's in the jacuzzi in the bathroom filled with tomato bisque soup and two models. Does that it's, really, does that, does it's that a sound, fantastic story. It's a great story, but does that sound I believe like Christopher it. Walken, though? Yeah. Does it? Yeah. I don't know. Come on. I don't know. Well, again, speaking of stories that may or may not be true, but there, it's great if it is. There's a story about Billy Wilder, the director, and there, he's going over to France to make a movie, and he asks his wife, is there anything I can bring back? And she says, yeah, I'd like a bidet. So he goes to France, he's making the movie, and she gets a telegram that says, Bidet unavailable, suggests you stand on your head in the shower. (laughs) (laughs) Now, whether that's true or not, it is A, a great story, Uh, and apparently kind of fits into what the Billy Wilder character was like. Huh. But but it, but it's an absolute great line, yeah, and yeah. Uh, I've stolen it and used it many many <laughs> times. Note yourself for future podcasts: never come in with a plan because this is awesome. <laughs> oh, oh, what what what, like what, you what is the plan? Oh, oh no, yeah. I'm just saying like this is, uh, you know, these podcasts. Some some of these episodes are like so free. <coughs> you know, we're talking to you, and, and conversations develop into what they develop. And I figured this would be a fun not to have such a hard subject. I mean, we just kind of kind of flow, and and uh, I'm loving the results. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Well, I you hope know, you are too listening. Yeah. One one of the great things of being born in a 1934 and b living in a very very small 2000 population in central Wisconsin, we would get movies that were made in the late 30s with Fred Astaire and Buster Crab and early John Wayne and. Uh, all kinds of, we would get those movies in our town about three or four or five years after they were made. So it was a thing that I was able to, and all of the kids in our town, we were able to grow up with some of the great movies that were made in the mid mid to late 30s uh, and 40s. And so we saw them all. And then I moved to Baltimore, Maryland, where yeah. the f- movies were, the first runs were shown in Baltimore. So I saw those. <laughs> And then I worked at the Clinton Theater for three years. So oh, yeah. it, it's just awesome. a thing that I, movies have been a part of my life, all of my life. And yet I can talk about the different periods and the kinds of movies that were made in those times that reflected yeah. those times. Now, question about that. So growing up, going to the movies, when a movie would come to your town, because back then they only made so many prints and they would almost do a road show. It wasn't like today where they come out at every theater in every state. But today we have television you know, showing us TV spots. We have the internet showing us trailers. Did you just, like when the new movie started at the theater, Did you had you seen anything about it? Or was it walking in blind to the new movie coming to town? It was kind of a thing. The star system was very, very big in those days. And so we did get to read about a lot of the stars and a lot of the movies they were in. I mean, they had like, I would say a good, on the newsstand, they always had a good 15 movie fan magazines, like Photoplay and Modern Movie and Modern, like there was a a magazine and they were about, they were about uh, time magazine size yeah. slick paper and all of that stuff but there was a movie it was called i think it was called movie story but the thing was it had the it had like a three or four page synopsis of 
each each magazine had about four current movies, the the complete storyline as to who did what to whom, and so forth like that. So right. even if you didn't see the movie, if you bought this magazine, you would know completely what that movie was like start to finish. And as I say, it was very, very common to have these. Um, the stars were much, much bigger in those days, much more promoted in those days because the studio system was in effect and they, they had big... Um, promotion departments no, no, did, so l like that doesn't exist anymore an actor makes a name for himself if he or she is just lucky enough to be in a big hit movie yeah and i don't think well, they it's really hard because we don't they don't have, change like, any names yeah. like well, they used to so did you did you when you were getting into all these films did you ever get into foreign films like kurosawa or the fellini films or you know did you ever get into I never screen here? I never got the, into them but in 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 my early day, like in in my days in uh, Baltimore and I I came to Columbus in my junior year in high school and the Drexel the no I think it was called the Bexley the Bexley Theater in Bexley obviously which is where the Drexel is now right? and, yeah and the World Theater which was on a high street almost at Lincoln, those two theaters showed foreign films. But um, I would see a couple, but I was never really a big foreign film yeah, sure. okay. addict about it. Except yeah. for those little films called Godzilla. Well, I didn't really consider those foreign films. Yeah. Not uh, well. They were all dubbed for America, right? All the one when they would show on TV and everything. Were they dubbed? Does anyone remember watching the Godzilla movies growing up? Oh yeah. They weren't subtitled, right? They were dubbed. I'm they pretty were sure dubbed, they were yeah. dubbed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Gosh, you know that's crazy. But yeah, like like speaking of stars, you know, I always said like when Michael Jackson died, I'm like, well, there goes our Elvis. There goes our. And then, of course, Taylor Swift has just kind of came in, and and I feel like you know, in her 17 years, she's been going. She is that iconic now to our kids and things like that. But with movie stars, I think it's, there's not a Taylor Swift of movie stars. I mean, there's well, not it, it, like it, Tom Cruise was the you know the thing. George Clooney was the thing. But after Clooney, I'm like, I don't know if there's been a star. Well, well, so is it Mackie, the guy um, Anthony Mackie says something where the, the, it's now characters, the actors they don't push actors anymore. Yeah, it's like characters. Um, so that's how Hollywood has changed. Which is kind of great because you could do your job. Per personally, that. I think it's. I'm I'm not very big on celebrity. Yeah, I'm right. not really big like when it comes to I you know I'm gonna sound like a snob here, but I really like the English actors more than the American actors because I feel that the Amer the British actors a lot of them come up through theater they they train at their crafts they do they can play lots of different people and when they're taking on different roles, they kind of escape in these roles. It's hard for me to find that with a lot of American actors. They're more like celebrities where I'm like, yeah, you're always that guy. Yeah. You know? Well, but I think that one of the reasons for that is the movie magazines of the 40s and the 50s where uh, the stars, you never knew what they were really like. Sure. You, you had the studio story as to what they were like and that's why when confidential magazine started up it threw the fear of what am i really like into the hearts of every star and there was a lot of blackmail going on as we'll tell you about this guy or this girl if you don't publish the story about this person so, so what happened to rock cuts and roy calhoun yeah. Or is this where LA Confidential were and, and ta uh, Tab, Tab Hunter was another one. It was uh, we will the agent was the agent for Rock Hudson, Rory Calhoun, and Tab Hunter. And when Confidential was going to do a story on Rock Hudson's sexuality, apparently again, what, from what I've heard over the years, apparently the agent said to Confidential, "Look, I'll give you." Ba I'll give you stories about 
Rory Calhoun and Tab Hunter, who were big stars at the time, if you don't publish the Rock Hudson story. And so Calhoun's prison record came out and Tab Hunter's questionable sacu- uh, sexuality came out and nobody knew, it. we're talking 50, oh, let's see, I was working at Patel at the time. That would be about 55, 56. Uh, Hudson was a big star at Universal and was pretty much on his way to superstardom. And and um, th- that's when confidential through the fear of God and to everybody, Robert Mitchum's prison thing was was a big deal well, and confidential. Well, do you remember Danny DeVito's character in L.A. Confidential? He had the magazine, Danny Ooh. DeVito's character in L.A. I'm Confidential. So, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't hear oh, the question. LA, L.A. Confidential with Guy Pierce and Kim Basinger. Danny oh, yeah. yeah so, great, great movie. So Danny DeVito right. had the, his magazine that he used to blackmail people. Right. And, you know, he was working with the cops. I, that, was that, where... sen- that was essentially Confidential Magazine, okay. which was the first one to outdo even the the tabloids in New York with scandals about yeah the stars who were not as glamorous as you, and this, nice you think well it's, it's like um well, they're human uh the Joan Crawford mommy dearest i mean nobody suspected Joan Crawford was that way until the daughter wrote the book and then these stories started yeah, to come sure. out Sure. Well, as, as a kid, when I was watching movies, I, <clears throat> like movie stars to me, I, I believe Tom Cruise, who who I love, I love his movies so much more more than I do the person. But I know that, but his movies to me are like the the perfect choices made by an actor to kind of go through a whole career. But as a kid, I remember being eight years old. I think Cocktail came out, or Color of Money, or Cocktails around that time, or Top Gun, and. Uh, I remember my mom and her friends just going, "We got to rent cocktail." It's like, they, and everyone thought Tom Cruise was hot. And then my grandmother, when Color of Money was out, she was all about. She said Paul Newman's the sexiest man alive. And I remember when him and Tom Cruise did a movie together. Mm-hmm. As a kid, that's how I learned. Like, oh, they're watching it for the actors. Yeah, sure. Not for and and Color of Money is a Scorsese movie. And um, depending on the mood I'm in, it's either kind of a slow, boring movie or. But I'll, but I'll tell you, when you watch Tom Cruise and, and Paul Newman together, the characters they are in that movie perfectly line up with he's kind of the young, cocky. Like with Hollywood at the time, it was almost like passing the torch. But, oh, sure. But have you seen The Color of Money? Oh, Paul yeah. Newman in that movie, when he's I don't talking. Know. So he's a hustler. I mean, it was a movie called The Hustler, mm-hmm. and then he plays the same character. When you watch Color of Money, twenty years later, yeah, yeah. When you watch Color of Money and he's talking to people, he's just—he's a salesman. I mean, he just sell you on anything. When Paul Newman is talking, he never speaks above this level the whole movie. Yeah, and you are just like, yeah, sure. And it's so amazing, and and it makes me want. I haven't seen a lot of Paul Newman movies, (laughs) but it makes me really understand. Like, oh, a movie star is somebody that you can literally. Well, disappear into sure, sure. wasn't you know, wasn't Tom Cruise's breakthrough the dance he did in his risky, risky underwear? Yeah. yeah, I think that was where I first became aware of him. Yeah, uh, was was in was in that movie. I, I don't know what was. Well, the other and you one? know, you know, what was risky business was his breakout, and then he did Legend, which was sort of this fantasy yeah. Ridley Scott thing. Then he did Top Gun, and that Blue, from yeah. there on it was right. Movie. But um, the thing about him, I think, that made him a star is he was sort of just, you know, this young actor. But he said that he would stay around, <coughs> like Risky Business and all these movies he did. He would stick around on his off days when they were shooting other people, mm-hmm. and he would just watch. And they would say, you don't need to be here today. And he's like, no, no, I want to be. And he'd watch, and he'd ask, now, why are you doing that? Or what? Talk to the DP. And, and he, throughout every single movie... He would not take a role unless he learned something new that he didn't know. So that's why he's producing now is because he's just like, I figured out how to make movies based on right. watching them make it and watching it. And I just, I admire that guy, you know, not personally, but sure, I admire sure. him for that. Well, but I think, I, think that, I think that was kind of a parallel to what Rob Reiner did, 
who was yeah. who was a star and knew how they were making from the time he was what 10 12 years old right, just hang out. i mean that was part of his life and I don't think he ever had, like with child stars of the 40s, they were big until they got to be about 12 or 13, and then all of a sudden their careers just died until, if they were lucky enough, they could get started again when they were 19 or 20. Yeah. But I don't think that Rob Reiner had a break in his acting career. That is, he went from adolescent to teenager to... Yeah. Um, adult star uh, with with no break like most of the child stars of the 40s and 50s had. Now, one of, the, kind of one, of, one of the great underrated actors who was a child star was Dean Stockwell. Oh, yeah. I mean, the boy with green hair. He was a, a, a kid star at MGM, but as he grew up, he just got better and better and better roles. And... Um, one of my favorite actors. Again, if if he's in it, <coughs> I'll I'll watch it. And yet, you say to most people on the street his name, and they won't know who you're talking about. Well, Dean Stockwell to me as a kid was Quantum Leap. Was that what? was Quantum Leap with Scott Bakula? Oh yeah, so, yeah. Like that's where I saw Dean Stockwell. Then when I was old enough to get into David Lynch, one of my favorite directors, Blue Velvet, Dean Stockwell's role was the creepiest. Because uh, I mean, everything about that movie is creepy. But Dennis Hopper. Probably plays the worst villain in movie history. The, the most bad, evil villain. I mean, it, Blue Velvet is is tough to watch. Yeah, him, yeah. Him as Frank Booth, but his friend Dean Stockwell in the movie uh, Frank or uh, no, not what was his name in the movie? They stay at his apartment, and Dean Stockwell. There's a scene where he takes this light bulb, and he sings in full Roy Orbison's "In Dreams." Mm -hmm. he mimes it. It's Roy Orbison's version playing, but he's lip syncing into this light bulb and he has lipstick on and makeup and he's got a cig one of those uh cigarette holder you it's know whatever it's called. amazing and it's one of the greatest scenes but my god is it just like bone chilling I'm it's really mag uh, surprising that as good as he was from childhood all the way through his death he was never regarded as a big superstar and yet he was an incredible actor, very, very good-looking. So you wonder, well, why was he never a teenage girl favorite? And he missed, he didn't, he was never that, and yet he had the ability to do that. And then he could do hero or villain, good guy, bad guy, middle-of-the-road guy. He could do anything. Again, again, sort of like Montgomery Clift. A lot of people forget that Clift in his very early, early, early days, I think Red River, and I forget the other one that, that he made at the time, he was a big teenage girl pin-up boy for a lot of years, regarded as the one of the top five most handsome guys in the world. Yeah. And um, his acting ability soon sort of... People forgot about that. They thought of him as, as a good actor mm -hmm. and... Uh, yeah so forth but but again in those days before confidential nobody knew the problems he had in his real life yeah now Vitus, you were saying earlier about like english actors versus american actors Inter it's so true because i remember i think i was 13 or 14 when i saw leon the professional mm, one of my favorite movies Ooh. yeah yeah and gary oldman i had no idea he was british Oh, I had seen right, him in sure. enough roles in America, yeah. and I was just like, there were there were three actors I think growing up that stood out to. Well, I mean, because Tom Cruise was he stood out to me as a blockbuster star, but I mean, when it comes to the craft of acting, Gary Oldman I started following after The Professional because I was like, I yeah, mean, sure. he, he's incredible. Yeah. And then um, Robert Downey Jr. I'd always loved because he's a chameleon; you can't tell it's him ever. Right. Johnny Depp was the other one, which now. Well, but because it, before Tim Burton, Johnny Depp. What was the last time he played a normal person? Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. What when he met Tim Burton, he's now that forever. Yeah, he he just plays. Just but he weird. used to be. Yeah, I guess so. But I feel <laughs> like know. he just plays weird people. He you does. know, no, and you're kind of like, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know. But Robert Downey Jr. Like I feel like he disappears 
I mean, when he was Chaplin, he was Charlie Chaplin. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Oppenheimer. It, it was an hour into Oppenheimer, and I'm at the theater watching this, an hour into Oppenheimer, and I'm looking at him going, who is that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I was like, wait, what? Is, wait, this is Robert Downey Jr. Of course so, it is. So I'm a little bit older than you, but I remember yeah. movies like when Robert De Niro was in a movie. Well, that was a big deal. Gary Oldman was British. When oh, I found yeah, that yeah out, sure. I, but yeah, go ahead. Sure. No, but like, you know, where Al Pacino, when they were in the f- movies, it like it was a big deal, you know, um, because they raised the stature of that movie. At least that's what I remember. But then well, now. Coming off of Godfather, they're both in Well, it, yeah, but yeah. no, but then now Robert De Niro is doing like. The Fockers movies or whatever, you know. Well, and uh, Al Pacino can't announce the best picture. To well, well right. Then Al Pacino, but now Al Pacino, <laughs> I feel like became a caricature of himself. Yeah. You know, well, like Al Pacino, when you watch him as Michael Corleone, he's such a he's a handsome guy, but he's also like. We well, watching the um was very the, chilling when you see him change. Yeah, well, the, the, his but first, for him to turn into the whole hoo ha. Yeah, yeah. But, well, his first movie was um, Needle Park. What was the? Do you oh. remember Fritz the? I think it was called Panic in Panic Needle, in Needle Park. Park. Yeah. yeah, that was his first movie. And when you see him, it's I have never heard of that movie. Oh yeah, it's it's amazing. And it's... Yeah, we used to show it on Night Owl. Oh, did you really? Oh wow. So it's so it's... that was before Dog Day. Afternoon. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So he okay. plays a uh, drug addict, and um, he's the, the performance is fantastic. Wow. It's so subtle. It's like there's so many layers to the performance, and then you watch Heat. And like so and, and, as, and as many people as they as they love Heat, he's that hua, you know, character. Oh, and, and you're he, like, I don't know. I I feel like he's, I don't know. Like, is he that anymore? Like, or he's just this character. Well, when he walked out, I mean, I gotta say, and, and I don't mean to uh, put anyone down or anything, but when he came out on stage to announce Best Picture this year, I was concerned for him. Sure. He just looked confused, kind of frazzled. He didn't right. look like hair and makeup had right. anything. Sure. And he's about to be a father again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. I mean, he's, he's got a kid on the way. And it's just like... Uh, but the, but, but this like great, with, amazing actor. And he's not even... I think, isn't he younger than De Niro? But with these guys, what are they being given? You know, I think, like, with right. De Niro, yeah, yeah. you know, I remember, like, I remember when he came out in Cape Fear... Oh, you know, God. That was amazing. So you know, good. I remember so when he good. did The Untouchables. Like, it was a big deal. And he kind of just raised these movies. So and, then, t- and then now, like, I don't know. Maybe it's because of what they're being given. Like, there's no right. scripts like that anymore for him, you know, because they're older. Untouchables, oh, man, that movie shocked me. Because as a kid, when I saw the trailers for the theater, I looked at it as this noir detective, like, I'm not interested, whatever. And I don't know... What year it was when I saw it, but it was on HBO or something, and I, and it's a he- really violent movie, so but like almost like parts, Tarantino yeah. violent, where you're like when someone gets shot, it's like, yeah, sure, yeah. And, well, the uh, baseball bat on the head yeah. at the <laughs> dinner party, yeah. woo. Or, or when it, Sean Connery gets killed. Yeah, oh my yeah, God, yeah, he's yeah. There just, yeah. I mean, bleeding from every. And I remember as a kid, you know, I was a gore hound, and when I saw that, I was like. I want to watch this. What this is the Untouchables? Yeah, I, yeah. I thought that was a safe Hollywood movie, and and then you know why? It's Brian De Palma, and yeah. so that was my intro to Brian De Palma. Uh, you know, but the and, only th- you know I love that movie. Yeah. You know, I saw it in the theater when oh, it when so it came out. I love it. The only thing that I that I don't like about it is the music, because it's um who's the like guy? The- no, like it's it, it's the- it's the guy that did the spaghetti westerns. It's oh, um Leon. Yeah, yeah Sergio Leon. Yeah. I, Is it? I think so, wow. listeners. But um, and this the only <coughs> thing that I go. Eh, this music feels off to me for some reason. But yeah. that's just personal preference, maybe. But well, okay, listen. So uh, we're on a roll here, listeners. But uh, I love this. Unfortunately, we only get like an hour a week with Fritz. So um, we're gonna pick this up next time you hear us. Uh, because we're this is great. So we're gonna continue talking about movies. This is what you love. This is why we love Fritz. This is what brings us all together. Friday nights, pizza, beer, movies, and our conversations. So join us next time on Conversations with the Al. By the time we see you again, we would have done another show. So we're gonna talk about the shows we've done and the movies on the next episode and continue this conversation. Thank you so much for listening and join us next time for Conversations with the Al.